Hi everybody and welcome back to Minka Guide. I'm your host Bronwyn and this month we're talking about why people think if you're bisexual then you must be non-monogamous. And very fittingly this month I also have uh, Rob from the Two Bi Guys podcast here to have this conversation with me. Welcome Rob. Hello, hi, how are you? Good to be here. Ah, I'm glad. Rob, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and why you're so perfectly suited for this topic? <laughs> well, I am a non-monogamous bisexual, so I'm, <laughs> I'm playing Surprise! into the stereotype right away. <laughs> but it is uh, not everyone is like me, and we'll discuss. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm Rob Cohen. I didn't come out as bisexual until a little bit later in life at like in my early thirties, I identified as straight until then. Um, and I think partially for that reason, it then, once I did come out, it became a big topic for me, almost like a cause. Cause I started mm. to think like, why didn't I come out sooner? And what led me to this road? Because once I came out, it seemed so natural and it made so much sense. And like the the universe like kind of started clicking into place and I like understood all these things that I didn't used to understand. And it connected me to not just other queer people, but other people in general in all these new ways. And I understood marginalization. I, I just, it just like transformed my mm. life. And so I wanted to talk about that a lot. And I started a podcast uh, with my friend Alex called Two Bi Guys. He had identified as gay for most of his life. I had identified as straight. And then we met at this bisexual discussion group um, in sort of in the middle. And so we started this podcast. We talked about it, all this stuff. We interview a lot of bi people. And then um, that eventually led me to write a book that came out at the end of 2023 called bisexual married men stories of relationships acceptance and authenticity and in that book i interviewed a bunch of bi men who are or were married to women and the topic of non-monogamy came up in every single interview which doesn't mean that they all were non-monogamous actually the majority wow like landed on monogamy or stayed there entirely but because there's this association between bisexuality and non-monogamy, one partner or the other would always end up bringing it up. And so every single one of those couples ended up at least discussing it, if not trying it out. So there's a complicated relationship. It's a good topic, but it's not a direct, <laughs> obviously it's not a direct relationship. Not all bi people are not monogamous. No, but I think that is, it's so interesting because this, um, the idea for this conversation came from your podcast because I was listening to all of these men talk about their experiences about coming into their bisexuality after getting married and then suddenly that being this uh, a conversation or a hurdle or an issue that was in their marriage then to kind of be explored or overcome or navigated um, because there was this idea, well, what, what does this mean for us now if you no. are, like are into more people, then does that mean that you're, you know, wanting to not be monogamous anymore? So that was right. really interesting, right. but it, it also brought up for me and I wondered what, what are some of the biggest kind of stereotypes you've come across about bisexuals that exist out there alongside, you know, non-monogamy? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's just funny that what, when you said that, it's like people think that bi people will want to sleep with other people because they're bi it's like well straight straight people are still attracted to like about half of the global population it's like well exactly. suddenly when it goes from three billion possibilities to six billion suddenly now you're non-monogamous but when it's three billion <laughs> you're you're fine with monogamy uh so it's funny how like that it's like Absolutely. straightness doesn't straightness doesn't necessarily mean you're only attracted to one person either so that, so mm -hmm. I mean, this is definitely a big one. Like that's an that's an interesting one. I do think there's there's the perception that bi people are. I mean, for bi men, the biggest one is like they're really gay, and the mm -hmm. gay side will win out eventually. There's a perception, I think, especially for bi men married to women, that 
eventually they will leave their female partner for men. Um, mm-hmm. That's a big one. And there's the there's a stereotype that we're just confused or we can't make up our mind. And that plays into the non-monogamy thing where it's like, not you just you can't make up your mind to, among the genders, and also you can't make up your mind to stick with one person. And I think if mm-hmm. you are a monogamously oriented person, which is fine and normal, and you're allowed to be that, uh, but many monogamously oriented people have this sort of perception. What was I going to say? I forget that that I guess that like that everyone is like that, right? That like, that's the ideal of love and that it's meant to be Mm -hmm. one-to-one. And the more I've like explored polyamory and like learned about it, it's actually quite natural and normal also. And it's a very different way of viewing the world, but it's not Mm -hmm. necessarily like something we're confused and figuring out. It is for most poly people I've met a place they've landed intentionally with a lot of thought and consideration and a lot of continually checking in to see if this actually works or, you know, am I just avoiding uh, commitment or avoiding something else? And I think f- that does happen, but for most poly people, it feels right for them based on many mm-hmm. years of exploration and feedback and evidence. And it just like, f- for me, it fits more naturally with how I view love and what is love. Um, so anyway, I got off the topic of stereotypes. But <laughs> no, no, those, no, no, those no, are so, no, no, no. You, those are some exactly of them. On, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're, you're exactly on topic. And it was funny because when you, st- you spoke about people thinking that being bisexual means you can't make a choice um, or make a decision. It reminded me, I saw on field recently, someone listed that they were non-binary, um, non-monogamous, bisexual, switch, and a Libra, but they were like, I promise I can make a choice. Like, do you know what I mean? Or I can make a decision. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. they were like, you know, I know I'm playing into all of the stereotypes right now, but I am actually able to make a constructive decision, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, and also like, I feel like I make lots of choices and some of them are hard choices and I'm capable of making them. But something I've come to understand that's in part of my bisexuality is like fluidity over time. And I have mm-hmm. realized that I'm different than I was 10 years ago and five years ago. And even Surprise. a few months ago, <laughs> I don't, I don't mind we, making, we change. Just, right. We change. And so once you acknowledge yeah. that it's not that it's hard to make a decision, but it does kind of feel limiting to lock yourself into decisions you're making now that will last forever. Um, Mm -hmm. And like, so I know it does get complicated with like commitment to a person because I do think, you know, I have commitments to people that I do want to last forever. But sometimes it's Mm -hmm. like, well, I don't know that the details of that arrangement will last forever. Like, I think our love will last, will last as long as we live. But how does Mm -hmm. that look? And how do we want to express that with each other? You know, that's stuff that like, I do feel kind of pressured to say, I'll, I'll want this situation forever. Um, I, yes. you know, I just don't know yeah, because how I'll really feel at in the, the end future. Of the day, none of us do, but we, yeah. our society places a lot of emphasis and value on being able to say, right. this is who I am and this is what I want and this is who I will be forever. And this is what I'll want forever. And the right. surprise that doesn't happen with anyone, like none of us can do right. That we can only move forward with the best intentions based on how we feel in the moment, of course. Right. But it also right. and, remind- and actually, no, can I going. can I can I say one yeah. other thing about that? It actually, to me, makes the love more meaningful to not have like these structures on top of it and these commitments that we don't that don't really come from within. Like, you know, I think mm-hmm. some mo- monogamous people get scared of that idea their partner could leave them if they don't want to be in it anymore. And it's like, Mm -hmm. yeah, but I wouldn't want to be in a relationship where like you have to stay in it if you don't want to just because you've made this commitment. Like to me, there's so much value in the polyamory of it and in the continual choosing to be together. Like I value my partners who make that choice every month, every week, every day to still want to be with me because they want to. 
then I know Mm -hmm. it's really real and authentic as opposed to like, well, my partner's still with me because we got married and we have vows and we have to stay together. That just Mm -hmm. doesn't feel as authentic to me as like, you could, if my partner could leave and is dating other people and could, could not want to be with me anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, then the fact that they're choosing to be with me feels so much more special and more meaningful because of that other choice they have. Yeah. And that's also, you can trust that. You trust that they are waking up every day and actively choosing to be there rather than they've right. made some commitment that they feel like they have to honor for the rest of their life. But also that right. topic of trust, I think, leads into this um, uh, conflation between um, bisexuality and non-monogamy because I think there's this idea and this stereotype that bisexuals can't be trusted because they can't mm-hmm. choose. They may, mm-hmm. you know, they may decide to go off with somebody else, another gender, blah, 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 whatever. They may be more promiscuous. Um, but also that um, with non- non-monogamous folks as well, it's just like, oh, well, they can't be trusted because you don't know what they're going to do at any point. You know, they could change their mind. They could do anything that you can't you know, build a relationship on that basis, I think. So I think that there is like a, 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 you know, a theme of trust that's in there as well that people Mm -hmm. feel like is, you know, perhaps why these things are, you know, linked together sometimes. Right, right. And, And that it's interesting, though, because what that brings up for me is that like, in order to make non monogamy work, you are forced to talk about so many things and talk through like and navigate stuff that's really hard to talk about. And you kind Mm -hmm. of just have to, to make it work. And when you get good at those kind of conversations and like really expressing yourself and really repairing a relationship after a rupture, uh, that all builds trust. And so Mm -hmm. I feel like I have even more trust with in poly relationships than I used to have in monogamous ones where a lot would go unsaid um, in, mm-hmm. in my past. Like I would as- make assumptions and just assume a partner felt this way or that I should be a certain way. And, and polyamory f- forces you to have these conversations. That's not to say you can't do that in monogamy. And many people do. Um, Mm -hmm. like it's totally, you can build trust in a monogamous relationship and you can express yourself authentically and like, and not keep things inside. But sometimes I do think the structures of monogamy allow things to go unsaid because the structure of that relationship style feels like enough that it's stable and it's consistent. Yes. And, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't like it's, it could be an illusion. And so, you know, I think it's really important regardless of your relationship style to have those tough conversations and really be authentic with a partner and talk about what you're scared Mm -hmm. of and talk about what you really want. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those things are what lead to trust, not, you know, not never sleeping with someone else. Um, yes. sometimes that can breed distrust if it's not authentic and, and it can breed resentment if you're not talking about it. So, you know, mm. the tr- but trust exactly. is, is super important. It just doesn't correlate the way many people think. Exactly. And I, I wonder when you were interviewing all of these bisexual married men for, it was originally the book and then the podcast. Is that correct? Yeah, I did the book and then I sort of did a season of the podcast where I re-interviewed some of the guys from the book who were okay to not be anonymous. Yes, exactly. I wondered how um, through those interviews you saw, uh, you know, illustrations of the challenging of this stereotype, you know, that, that, you know, bisexuality must mean non-monogamy, that bisexuals can't be trusted, that it must mean the end of that relationship, that it, you know, all of these kind of things. Were there some examples that particularly come to mind for you? Yeah. I mean, and I tried to sort of put a diverse range of experiences in the book. Like I did get to choose what people sort of told me the brief version of their story. And I chose, so like, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not a scientific study, but it does represent a lot of possibilities. So, you know, there were some, sometimes non-monogamy got brought up by the guy in the relationship 
because that was something he wanted to try. Uh, mm-hmm. And for many, many of those guys, it was it was people who didn't get to explore that before their marriage. So like many bi guys don't come out or don't even realize it until they're married. And I think, you know, Mimi Huang talks a lot about like, how can we live out our bi-ness um, and, and like actually express it in our bodies? And one of those ways is to be sexually active with men and women. And I think especially for guys who never had that chance to explore before they entered a monogamous relationship with a woman, that's something that they often want to do or, um, you know, really it's on their mind. So, so some of those guys were like that. Some of them, they opened up their marriage and explored it and, and, and they're together and they're not monogamous. Some of them opened up and then did not stay together. I would argue Mm -hmm. it's not because they opened up their marriage that they ended up not together. It's, that was sort of just something that happened and they were not going to stay together anyway. Um, Mm -hmm. But, but it's hard to say, like, you you know, you don't really know the trajectory. I will say every, every guy who came out to his wife and explored non-monogamy doesn't regret doing that. Um, Like they're all happy. They came out and expressed all this and had these discussions and opened things up. Um, it was better than living with it repressed. Um, I can imagine. So then there was, yeah. so there was that. And then there's like, um, then there were guys who didn't necessarily want to open things up. Some of them were guys who did get to explore sexuality with other men at a younger age or before they got married at some point, um, or just people who are naturally monogamous they wanted to come out to their wives about being bisexual, but not open their marriage up. But then because they came out as bi, their wives assumed that this was going to lead to non-monogamy or that they would want to hook up with guys. And so the wives brought up non-monogamy and Mm. it became a discussion in that way. And for some of them, the husband was like, no, I don't, want to explore this i just want you to know that i'm bi and i want to be out as bi Mm -hmm. great they stayed monogamous and they moved on or some of them did open it up for a short time and then close their marriage again uh Mm -hmm. and then and then there were others like it was hard to negotiate that it was hard for their wives to like really believe that they didn't need to explore this and for Mm -hmm. some of them like there's one couple in the book who i also interviewed on the podcast i interviewed both of them on the podcast and his wife talks about like how scared she was and it took her so long to believe that he didn't need to explore. And to be honest, sometimes they still struggle with that and they're still sort of thinking maybe they'll explore a threesome like together Mm -hmm. uh, so that he can have that experience. But, but in that case, he keeps sort of insisting he doesn't need it. Like he just wants to be out and be able to talk about it and be open about it but he doesn't need to explore that um, Mm -hmm. in, in person. And so there's there, basically there's a range. It always comes up as a topic, whether, whether, you know, whichever partner brings it up, but not, not everyone in my book needed to explore that. Some who explored it then went back to monogamy um, and some opened it up and it works. And then some, and then there are some from each of those categories where, the marriage ended. And, and what I talk about in the book is like, we view relationships generally as like, if they don't last till the end of your life, they were a failure. And I, the writing this book and talking to these guys helped me reframe like what is success and failure in a relationship. And to me, it's not staying together forever. In fact, many times that can be a sign of a failed relationship if it wasn't like, meaningful and authentic Mm. and like positive for the people involved. Like if you have a nice relationship with someone for some amount of time, and then after a certain amount of time, it's not working for both of you, you shouldn't stay in it and you should still be able to celebrate what it was and what you had. And it can still be a success even if it ends. Yes. 
Absolutely. I think that's one of the things that comes up a lot these days is understanding that this toxic notion that we have that, you know, oh, if a relationship ends, it fails. Do you know what I mean? Like, unless you're committing for life and it ends because one of you die, like that's, you know, anything other that diverts from that kind of narrative is therefore a failure, which is just so disappointing because we all have these days many lovely relationships in our lives like most people don't marry the first person they date do you know what I mean but that doesn't mean that those connections don't have worth and don't have value um for all of us so I think yeah I think that's um it's really interesting that through doing the podcast that reframed that for you you know that you kind of were able to see that as well um yeah one of the things the things that's most interesting as well about you, you know, what, what's so important about your podcast and this book and just generally, you know, we're talking a lot about bisexuality um, in men. Um, but I think that this is something that feels very, very different, even from like about five, definitely 10 years ago, is this rise in visibility of bi men. Like I yeah. have seen in the last couple of years, I mean, I've only been on dating apps for five years, but um in that time, I've seen the rise of me- number of men, like just openly indicating that they're buying there has risen dramatically. And mm. which for me is amazing because I want to date by guys like, you know, like um, I'm queer and like, you know, I, I, if I'm going to date a guy, like that's totally, you know, the kind of guy that I want to yeah. date. So for me, I'm just like, yeah, when I see it happening, I'm just like, amazing. this is amazing. So why do you think that that um, visibility has happened? What what do you think has ushered in that switch, you know, that people feel more comfortable now? I think it's mostly my podcast having its global <laughs> reason. <laughs> my, uh, you know, we started five years ago, so it's like, that's like... <laughs> You're like, looking at this. <laughs> There's the evidence. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I mean, I think it's, I don't know, like, I don't think, I actually don't think it's because of my podcast, but I do think it's like related. There's more, just more and more stuff. There's more books. There's more social media people. There's a lot more like, yeah, on TikTok and Instagram. I mean, the younger, I just think it's like a snowball effect maybe where like there was a lot of bi activism for decades that Mm -hmm. didn't fully sink in. Like I didn't really see it when I was growing up, but it was there and they were planting the seeds and laying the groundwork. And I think it just, everything really started to bloom in the last five to 10 years. And honestly, maybe the pandemic helped. (laughs) It's like the silver lining of the pandemic is like, we had all this time to live with ourselves and, do self-reflection and we also had this crisis of like shit could go bad quickly like the world could end or your you know life is short you only live once and i do think there was a big something that happened then where like people thought if i don't talk about this or accept this and come out now when am i and like what's the point of keeping it to myself So I do think a lot of people came out during the pandemic and then it's like a snowball effect and it's the, the seeds blooming, right? Like the more uh, exposure there is and the more visibility, it'll just compound on itself and grow and, and exponentially quickly. And that's what you're seeing with the statistics, like young people now who grew up, who are growing up now with this environment they're so much more bi. Like, they're so much more queer. The statistics are like, I think it's like a quarter of Gen Z is queer. And like, the the increase in that is mostly an increase in bisexual identified people under the bi umbrella. Bi, pan, fluid, questioning, Mm -hmm. queer, like some non-monosexual version of queer. Like, basically, it's doubling in every generation, the number of queer people and the number of bi people is like more than doubling um so it's just as it becomes more accepted like younger people are realizing maybe we don't have to box ourselves in like straightness boxes you in but honestly like maybe we don't have to box ourselves in with gay and lesbian labels either because those are also monosexual and can be limiting if you're somewhere in the middle of the spectrum so 
I, yeah, yes. I'm not totally sure, but it's just e- expanding on itself. Exactly. Yeah, it's so interesting because as someone who is a teenager in the 90s and actually came out as bisexual in the 90s, like, you know, maybe like 98, 99, something like that. Um, nice. And then like quickly changed, yeah, quickly changed to queer once I hit university and started kind of exploring more about stuff like that. But I I remember because, you know, it was in the 90s, uh, women being bisexual was such a like seen as this very commodified sexual thing. Do you know what I mean? Like that it was Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. seen as okay and cool and stuff like that, which is, you know, to say that roundly is, you know, not necessarily true because as someone who grew up in regional Australia and came out in high school, that is not necessarily what my experience was at all. It wasn't considered um, necessarily a cool thing, but it was in the media. We were seeing on TV shows like, Buffy and in films, you know, girls kissing each other seemingly being this like, you know, cool thing. But it was like for men, it was still such an enormous, enormous taboo. Um, and mm-hmm. so it, it is really interesting to see how that shift with like gender stuff is happening. And also, as you say, during right. the pandemic, it's not just like sexuality. It's like people's gender identity, their relationship structures. Everyone started like right. questioning a lot of that stuff. So that I think that's why we're seeing that huge wave of change um, right. happening now where people are starting to be like, well, you know, life could actually turn out to be kind of short. So I may as well just start living it how I want to now. And so, right. yeah, actually, by the way, it turns out I am i don't fit into the norm in the following ways, um, which right, is, you know, right. give, giving everyone some lovely flavor and stuff like that. So <laughs> Right. And I, actually, I'm glad you mentioned the gender stuff. I, I don't know why I forgot to mention that, but I do think they're like very related in that I've learned a lot about gender and I see gender as more fluid now in a way I didn't necessarily understand that 10, 15 years ago. And so I think as that becomes more visible, it really also causes people to check in about their sexuality. Like, especially if you know people who are gender fluid or non-binary or trans, it's like, oh, I, I like, you know, I've seen people transition, my wife, for example. And I'm like, oh, I'm still attracted to you regardless of your gender. So like, mm-hmm. what does that mean about my, if I wasn't already bi, I would be now. Or like, what if you're attracted to a non-binary person? Does that mean you're still straight? Or like those, you start asking yourselves those questions as you meet people who are exploring the gender spectrum. And that will necessarily, okay. that will like often affect your sexuality. Um, mm-hmm. And then another thing you said, I, I just also want to point out, like, I think that I think that the queerness and the gender fluidity has always been there under the surface. It's just that it hasn't been allowed, you know, it hasn't been societally accepted to be out and talk about these things. And so I think Sweet. like, you know, it's rising, rising, like what, 25% of Gen Z is queer, right? Like, I don't know if that's the peak or if 50% or 75%, like, I don't know what the peak is, but whenever we get to the peak and we plateau, that I think has always been there. Like the 25% yes. at a minimum has always been there. It just has, we just haven't been able to express it and show it safely. And now it's becoming, it's like lefties. Like there, you know, people used to think there were no lefties, but it was that we trained it out of people in school and we didn't allow people to be lefties. And once we allowed it, it, it rose and then it plateaued and there's a certain number of natural lefties. And I think it's going to be the same thing. Like it's always been there. Uh, mm. Yeah. Well, I'm totally curious to see where that plateau comes if it happens in my lifetime. Cause I'm like, tell me, I want to know. I grew up being yeah. told I was one in 10 because I was queer, but now we're seeing actually those statistics are not true. So uh, yeah. that's really interesting. But the final question I have for you, I don't know if you've watched the show um, Couple to Thruple yet, or have you seen <laughs> bits of it or anything? Like that? <laughs> not yet. Not yet. I know it's on my list. I've heard about it. People are telling me I should watch it. <laughs> I was very pessimistic at the start. And to be honest, the first episode is something that you just have to get through because you're like, oh my God, what is this polyamorous representation? Polyamorous representation I'm seeing. But actually it really grew on me. And by the end, I was like really, really into it. But I did, I, I, I came through it all with the thought of like, wow, 
bisexual non-monogamous really do have the most fun because I was seeing in the in the setup of it all if you were bisexual you were just like had so many more options in that show whereas the people who were straight were like oh no we're looking for this person to fit our dynamic to be this very specific Uh thing whereas all the like non-binary non-monogamous bisexuals were just having an absolute field day and they were like what about this option what about this and I was just like you know it it made me just be like oh yeah well you know when when we shake off the stereotypes and we shake off the shame and we shake off the negativity, it is actually quite a fun thing to be. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. I mean, I, like, I think that that's what my favorite part of bisexuality and queerness in general is, is this like freedom of anything is can make is like cool. I like anything can make me happy. And, and I, you know, like, I think that it's just so freeing and liberating to be able to like not always go in with expectations or know exactly what you want and to be pleasantly surprised and happy with whatever you find and whatever's there because every person is unique and interesting and like not that you have to be attracted to everyone and bi people are not attracted to every person but the potential yeah. is there with anyone. There's no disqualifier, right? Uh, or at mm-hmm. least there's not a gender disqualifier for bi people. And and in general, queerness is more, I think about this like open-mindedness of not having this specific, here's the dynamic, here's the exact thing we're looking exactly. for. And I just think that's so beautiful and fun. And And I used to be one of those people who thought it has to be like this. And I like these certain things. And over time, I realized it was just like, oh, uh, I do like those things, but there's also more I might like if I tried it and opened myself to it. And uh, it's been just such a fun journey of like doing that step by step and at every step realizing, yeah, this is cool too. Like, why? I don't know what I was afraid of. Uh, I'm open to lots yeah. of different things and it's so freeing. How lovely. What a lovely, lovely note to end on there, Rob. Um, If people were interested in finding your podcast or your book, how or whatever online, um, how would they go about doing that? Uh, My website is robertbrookscohen.com and you can find everything on there. The the podcast, the book, my coaching practice. I'm a life coach for bi people. And then the podcast is called Two Bi Guys. So wherever you listen to podcasts, if you search Two Bi Guys, you will find it. Perfect. Um, If you're watching this on YouTube, there'll be links to everything in the show notes underneath. And if you're reading this, seeing this on my blog, there'll be links to everything um, on there as well. So thank you so much, Rob. This was such a wonderful conversation to have. And um, yeah, good luck with your future endeavors with the podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lovely little conversation. I enjoyed it. Nice to to finally get to do it. Exactly. Yes. (laughs) Okay.